tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. The name alone is enough to make you stop and think twice. Welcome to the Devil's Backbone in Central Texas. Locals say it's the most haunted spot in the country, a mother load of restless spirits sure to frighten you, or perhaps even possess you. A Romeo and Juliet love affair ends tragically when Leroy Dreitz says goodbye to his girlfriend and just minutes later smashes his car into a tree. The coroner called it suicide, but Leroy's sister Vicky believes she has compelling evidence that Leroy was murdered. When David Kempton invited a new friend home to dinner, he never imagined his wife and this friend would become lovers. Within months, David's wife left him. Then she dropped from sight along with David's four-year-old daughter. Join me. Perhaps tonight you can make a difference. Perhaps you can help solve a mystery. County, Colorado, Memorial Day, 1968. Leroy Dreith is killed instantly. The coroner's ruling is suicide. 25 years later, at his family's request, the body of Leroy Dreith is exhumed for an autopsy. It is a culmination of a long struggle for Leroy's sister, Vicki, who is convinced that her brother was murdered. I took a vow that I would um, do this for my brother, and I don't feel like I can stop until it's done because I would be letting him down. And I already feel like the authorities let him down and that obviously someone took his life and that he can't, I can't let him down. Someone has to stand up and talk for him. Vicki Marling is a woman on a relentless quest. A quarter of a century may seem like an eternity, but for Vicki, time has stood still since the day her brother died. Her mission is simple, to bring Leroy's killer to justice, no matter how long it takes. Leroy Dreith was the oldest of four children. At 17, Leroy fell in love with a 16-year-old Hispanic girl named Patty. A year later, they were engaged. On the day he died, Memorial Day 1968, Leroy attended a party at Patty's house. He left in the late afternoon. A block and a half away, Leroy's car smashed head on into a tree. Word of the accident spread quickly. The first people on the scene were Leroy's father and brother. Leroy? Leroy? Son? It's okay. I tried to hug him, and I said, I'll get you, I'm going to go get you some help. So I run to the truck and told Doug, so I said, we'll run to the grocery store and call the ambulance. The other way, sir. Need to clear that. Need to clear this area. Other way, sir. Whoa. Folks, does anybody know what happened here? He had a fight with his girlfriend. He said he's going to kill himself. It was that off-handed remark from a bystander that set the suicide scenario in motion. Ambulance driver Delbert Mickelson remembers. The coroner come to the hospital and uh, went over what happened. And then I, I was the first one to relay the story to him that uh, he'd had a fight with his girlfriend and was going to kill himself. Based on that information, the coroner deemed no autopsy was necessary. He attributed Leroy's death to, quote, auto-suicide. 
I went to the district attorney in Greeley, and I said, I don't believe this uh, was a suicide. I believe it was a murder, and I need for you to investigate it. And um, he was very rude. He said, um, you're just a distraught parent. There's no reason for us to investigate this. You just go on home and get over it. I just cried and went home. I never got over it. Why don't you take this? You always liked it. For 11-year-old Vicki, Leroy's death would prove to be the defining moment in her life. I remember that my mom was crying for a long time. And even though I was only 11, I, I knew there was something wrong. But I had to wait until I was an adult to attempt to solve the problem. I never did believe that Leroy committed suicide. June 1988. Vicki paid a surprise visit to the Boulder County Coroner's office. She fully expected to be stonewalled. Instead, she discovered that the current regime had already noted the lack of a thorough investigation into Leroy's death. Well, you see, there's only three recorded auto suicides in the whole history of Colorado. Only three? And also because, you see, the other two cases, you know, had six-month investigations with uh, reams and reams of uh, paperwork. And as you can see, with this report, it's Why? very minimal. Well, yeah, two pages. Why is there only two pages? I really couldn't tell you, but I want to encourage you to look further into this. And if I were you, I would hire a private investigator. I felt like it was a real strange thing for them, for the authorities, to bring it to my attention uh, as dramatically as they did that something's wrong here. Vicki became her own investigator. She knocked on doors. She talked to Patty's neighbors, looking for anyone who had any memory of the day her brother died. Yeah, well, that's what they said, that there has been a fighting. Oh, they said there was a big fight. Uh, but I don't know, uh, you know. According to the townspeople, there was a party going on at Patty's house. And there had been a fight, but that it had not been between Patty and Leroy. Yeah, it wasn't me and that there had been uh, several other family members there that um, did not like Leroy and that had been drinking all day. Vicki heard similar stories from a number of people, but not everyone was convinced that there was more to the situation than suicide. Vicki had little luck with the son of the original sorry, coroner. I'm very sorry, but I just want you to know one thing. My father was a coroner here for 25 years. He was very good at what he did. I'm sure he did everything he could. Now, there's really nothing more I can help you with. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Finally, Vicki placed an ad in the local paper, urging Leroy's former girlfriend, Patty, to contact her. It worked. I went to the coroner and got the coroner's report. And um, it stated that you had told the authorities that he was uh, going to leave your house to kill himself. Did you say that? No, no, I, I never said that. Can you tell me anything about that day? Anything else? No. I felt like Patty knew answers, but was reluctant to talk. As far as Vicky was concerned, the evidence was becoming undeniable. I, re I just, I don't think about that day anymore. Next came the exhumation. At long last, after 25 years, the body of Leroy Dreith would be autopsied. It was a tough decision. It took me about six months to finally decide that they weren't going to do anything and couldn't do anything unless we did the exhumation. It, it almost didn't seem right. But on the other hand, it seemed wrong to just stop there and say, oh, well. It was immediately apparent that uh, this young man had sustained some sort of incised wound to the neck, actually two incised wounds to the neck. And they were very characteristic of what I see all the time in other persons who have uh, received stab or slash wounds to the neck from a knife. Vicki was stunned. In simple layman's terms, the two incisions translated into a stab wound nearly two inches long and a slash four inches long that severed Leroy's windpipe. Based upon Dr. Allen's findings, the cause of Leroy's death was changed from auto-suicide to undetermined. 
For Vicky, crucial questions remained. Who killed her brother and why? In retrospect, everything leads back to Patty's house. Um, every time I think of a scenario, think of what happened, the same conclusion and the same thought that it, it started at Patty's house with an argument. Leroy arrived at around 5 p.m. Hi. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Mm, you look beautiful. Thank you. you want some One of the guests was Patty's sister-in-law, Carolyn. Yeah. Looks good. <laughs> Leroy come over that day, and a lot of Patty's family was there, and everyone had been drinking quite heavily that day. I was married to Patty's brother, and I was living in the house with the family for about eight months before and after this happened. And uh, Patty's family and Leroy had a slight argument, kind of a racial argument over girlfriends and boyfriends. Why don't you just go find yourself a nice little white girl, huh? Huh? I love her and she loves me, okay? You're a Soon after the argument, Patty escorted Leroy to his car. Vicky is convinced that just before he drove off, Leroy was attacked by one of Patty's family members. I believe that they continued arguing and that a, a male person um, uh, just quickly reached out and uh, cut Leroy's throat. I feel that Leroy was probably fleeing for his life in the automobile and then lost consciousness or lost control of the vehicle because of the injuries. He would have been in, ex in pain and uh, would have been extremely afraid, but the actual cause of death were injuries sustained from the automobile crash. I feel like I have become a cop in this whole scenario which is very difficult at times because I have no training and I don't know what to do and I'm sure I've made the wrong mistakes at times. But I also know that I care deeply about my family and that I love my brother very much. And I know that as long as I'm doing this with my heart pure and doing it for the good reasons that there is going to be a conclusion. Unsolved Mysteries, each and every case solved brings us feelings of immense satisfaction. Tonight's update is particularly gratifying. It involves a young man sentenced to life in prison for a murder most people are convinced he did not commit. On Sunday night, April 13, 1986, fire and rescue squads raced to a raging house fire in Aurora, Missouri. When firemen were finally able to search the wreckage, they found the body of 79-year-old Pauline Martz. She had been bound, gagged, and left to die. Investigators concluded the fire had been deliberately set. Oh, I'd say I was. Five days later, the police questioned a local 20-year-old named Johnny Lee Wilson. Wilson is mildly retarded with an IQ in the mid-60s. In this chair, and he sat here and looked you right in the eye and said, John, you was there before that fire started. After a grueling four-hour interrogation, Wilson confessed, a confession he would later recant. He mad at you? At the end of the, at the, end of the interrogation, he, he, he forced my head back, and that's, that's when I said, OK, OK, I did it. But when I really didn't, that's, that's when I lied. The court finds the Johnny's attorneys recommended that he plead guilty to avoid the possibility of the death penalty. In doing so, he waived his right to a trial by jury. In April of 1987, Johnny Lee Wilson was sentenced to life in prison. Court stands adjourned. He was immediately remanded to the Missouri State Penitentiary. Several legal experts, incensed by this apparent injustice, sprang to Johnny's defense. 
It's one of those cases, perhaps there's only one in a thousand, where an innocent man is doing time in the penitentiary. And Johnny Lee Wilson is innocent. And if he had a trial, he would probably be acquitted. I don't think the jury would deliberate more than an hour before they acquitted him. And it's a shame that he never got a chance to prove his innocence. All I, all I want is somebody to believe in me, you know, you know, just that I didn't do this. Over the years, a case against Johnny Lee Wilson began to fall apart. A key witness recanted his testimony. An inmate in another prison actually confessed to the crime. Nevertheless, both the State Court of Appeals and the Missouri Supreme Court refused to grant Johnny a trial. Johnny Lee Wilson had only one other option, one last hope. Here's Keeley Shea Smith with the details. In July of 1994, Johnny's case came before Missouri Governor Mel Carnahan. Johnny's attorneys had requested a pardon on the grounds that there was no evidence against their client. Only, quote, a pathetic, desperate confession after hours of interrogation. My counsel uh, re-interviewed the witnesses, talked to the prosecutors and the police, uh, looked at the evidence, read the transcripts, a uh, year-long study, and we became convinced that uh, it wasn't appropriate, not only wasn't appropriate for him to remain in prison, but that he was innocent. The pardon was granted. On September 29, 1995, Johnny Lee Wilson was finally a free man, exonerated of all charges. I, ne I never, never thought that I would see the day that I would walk out those doors and, and be driving away from that place. It felt great. Altogether, Johnny had spent nine years, five months, and 10 days behind bars. At a hastily assembled news conference, Johnny's thoughts turned to Pauline Martz. Why, why would someone hurt a nice lady like Pauline? She was a wonderful person, a friend of my grandmother's, and she was a very cool person. Following his release, Johnny was reunited with his mother and grandmother. It made mother and I cry, and we just, you know, uh, we hugged each other and all of us, and it was really happy. Could hardly believe it, you know, after all those years. Johnny now lives with his mother and grandmother in his hometown of Aurora, Missouri, where he hopes to put his long ordeal behind him. I have no bitterness or nothing, you know. I got so much faith, you know. I, I knew sometimes, somehow, that I was gonna get out. I just, I'm just glad I did. New Year's Eve, 1952. A time of hope and guarded optimism. Ike had been elected president. The conflict in Korea was drawing to a close. But in Glendale, California, David Kempton's world was about to come apart. I'm here with my wife. Oh, my beautiful wife. David's wife, Barbara, was in love with another man. Hey, what's wrong with you? Well, we don't hug anymore. We don't kiss anymore. David. Nine months later, Barbara would disappear, along with the couple's young daughter, Donna. The last time I saw her was just a few weeks after her fourth birthday. It's been a very long time. So I'm sitting there with this guy I met down at the plant. He says, watch this. David Kempton's troubles began in July of 1951, when he brought a co-worker home for dinner. And a couple of seconds later, he flags me over, and I meet Barbara Stanwyck. At the time, the Kemptons lived in Ohio. David and Barbara had been married for five years and had two children, Stephen and Donna. I sat down with her for a few minutes, and then some guy came over. David's new friend, Charles, was an engaging storyteller who entertained everyone with delightful tales of his adventures around the country. I'm telling you, it's an amazing city, Los Angeles. Charles was a person who lived an unusual kind of life. Almost anything or any place you wanted to talk about, he had some stories related to it. 
There's restaurants, there's nightclubs, there's dancing. Charles never stopped talking about California, the promised land. Eventually, David and Barbara decided that was the place to be. All went well until Charles joined the Kemptons on the West Coast. I'm in love with Charles. What? I want a divorce. Son of a... I was totally unhorsed. I... Charlie! Stop. Damn you! I had never considered such a thing. But I didn't know there was anything that wrong with the marriage. Sorry, but I'm leaving. Like Eventually, that. what we decided was that if that's where things were going to be, I would step out of the picture, he would step into my shoes, there'd be as little disruption as possible with the kids, uh, and I went back to Cleveland. David, it's Barbara. I'm in Arizona. But within about a month or five or six weeks, I got a phone call. Um, Charles is gone. It was totally out of the blue, a, a thunderbolt. I'm with the kids and I want to come home. I sent her the bus tickets and I tore out and dug up a house for us to live in. Davis' joy was short-lived. Within weeks, Charles was back in the picture. Barbara moved out again. She moved back in. Then she dropped another bombshell. I'll live here and I'll take care of our children. But don't ask me for anything more. This time, David left, and he took the children with him. A judge soon granted David temporary custody of both Stephen and Donna. Barbara received weekend visitation rights. On the occasion of the first weekend visitation, she called me ahead of time to say that she was in a rooming house and couldn't accommodate both kids. Could she just take Donna? i see you guys Sunday afternoon. Sure, OK. Bye, sweetie. So on Friday, I had to deliver Donna. So I'm just here to pick up my daughter, Donna. And Sunday evening, went back to pick her up. My wife. Um, yes. Do I just go on inside, or? Oh, uh, no. They, they left yesterday. They packed up some family what? business and had to leave. Wait, that's not right, ma'am. I'm supposed to pick up Donna today. This she afternoon. wasn't there. They weren't here. I'm just going to take a look at this. It was devastating, because I had no way, not a way in the world, to know where they might have gone. More than 40 years have now passed. 40 years of birthdays, dances, graduations, perhaps a wedding, and even grandchildren. I'd like Donna to know that she's always been a part of my feeling. Whenever anyone mentions what kids do I have, usually I'll, I'll include her in the count. I want to say hello and that I love you, if in whatever way that's possible under the circumstances. I have love for you. We'll be back in a moment to investigate the mysterious disappearance of a young woman named Bonnie Haim. Some people believe her husband was more about Bonnie's fate than he is saying. Christmas morning, 1992. In Jacksonville, Florida, a young wife and mother, Bonnie Haim, opened presents. Bonnie's husband, Michael, captured the moment forever on videotape. Less than two weeks later, Bonnie Haim would inexplicably vanish. Police began to suspect that Bonnie was dead, a victim of foul play. Their suspicions soon focused on Michael Haim. Among the most damning evidence was the extraordinary testimony of a surprising witness, Michael and Bonnie's three-year-old son. Bonnie Haim's uncertain fate and the cloud of suspicion that hangs over her husband, Michael, have spawned a contorted family dispute. On one hand, Bonnie's own parents believe that she was unhappily married and willfully abandoned Michael and her son. 
And yet some members of Michael's family are convinced that Bonnie is dead, murdered by Michael Haim. Bonnie, I'm sorry to say, is, is gone. She's not alive. If she was alive and had one ounce of life in her, she would have contacted someone. There are thousands of, of women that, that leave their husbands and families every year. And it's always a complete surprise to their families. Should have done by the end of the day. Okay, they need it by tomorrow. Okay, go on. Michael worked as a manager in the construction supply company owned by his aunt Ivan and her husband. Bonnie did their accounts. Bonnie, let's go to lunch. Ivan claims that Michael was often abusive to Bonnie at the Sorry, office. Let's go. Well, just go without me. What is so important that you can't go to lunch? Why? Don't start. Ivan also claims that at least once, Michael's abuse became physical. One day, they got into an argument um, in a fight in the parking lot, and she came in crying, and he had slammed her hand in the door, and her nails were broke, and she was very upset at that point. Ivan says that Bonnie eventually decided to leave her husband, and in preparation, opened a bank account in her own name. To keep her plan secret, Bonnie had the bank statements mailed to her at work. According to Ivan, Michael was enraged when he found out. Michael, what are you doing? No, what are you doing, Bonnie? Why don't I know about this? We're married. This is our money. It should be in our account. Well, it's from my paycheck. Well, you're going to close it, and you're going to close it today. Do you understand me? Bonnie closed the account. But according to those closest to her, Bonnie never wavered in her plan to divorce Michael. She secreted money with a friend for safekeeping and went so far as to put a deposit on an apartment and enroll her son in a new preschool. Hi, on the evening of January 6, 1993, Bonnie came home from work at around 7.30 p.m. She intended to drop by Evans at 8 to finalize plans for a co-worker's baby shower. About 8.30 that evening, she called me on the phone. Hi. Um, listen, about tonight, I'm not going to be able to make it. I'm really sorry. She was sorry. crying, okay. and she was upset. Bonnie, is something the matter? I asked why. No. She said that her and Mike Just had gotten into a discussion. And I asked her if she wanted me to call her back later. And she said no, that she would just talk to me in the morning. Oh, actually, not too good. I think I'm coming down with something. But the next morning, neither Bonnie nor Michael showed up at work. She's not here. I don't know. She, uh, we had an argument. Well, she got mad at me last night and took off. Uh, I don't know where she's at. However, hopes for Bonnie's safe return began to dim that same morning. Her purse turned up roughly five miles from home, buried in a motel dumpster near the Jacksonville airport. Robbery apparently was not a motive due to the amount of money and the credit cards being there. It had uh, all of her identification checkbook, and the purse was secured by the maintenance worker, and a police officer was called to the scene along with family members. 100, 160, 70, 173. Does there appear to be anything missing from the purse? No, it's all there, as far as I can tell. Hi, John. You OK, Michael? When I walked into the room, Did she give any indication of where she was Mike no. and his dad Nothing. She were in there. there. She didn't tell me anything. Michael didn't say Even. much about Bonnie being missing. What the hell was Bonnie doing with all that money? He didn't just come out and, like, Oh my God, my wife is gone, where is she? Um, just nothing, nothing. Michael has insisted from the start that he was not involved in his wife's disappearance. He says that on the night of January 6th, Bonnie drove off alone after an argument at around 11 p.m. Mom, thanks for He coming. stated that he called his mother, Carolyn Haim, and asked her to come over to the house in the early morning hours and watch the child while he went and looked for Bonnie. I won't be long. You be careful. 
According to Carol Ann, Mike, he was gone approximately 45 minutes. Then after he allegedly did that, he returned to the house where he waited until the next morning, never calling the police, and called in and told his employer that he was going to be sick that day. Detective Hinson was less than convinced by Haim's account. His instincts led him back to the Jacksonville airport near the motel. Herb, isn't that it? Sure enough, there was Bonnie's car, abandoned in a lot for long-term parking. What was unusual about Bonnie's car when we found it at the airport was the positioning of the seat, the driver's seat of the car, which appeared to be farther back than would have been comfortable for Bonnie to have driven the car. Uh, it was more in relation to someone about Michael Haim's size. And after the vehicle was processed, we found a shoe print in the driver's side floorboard. It was a very pristine print. Police concluded that the print had been made by the last person to drive the car. The distinctive tread pattern was traced to a rare style of athletic shoe. One pair was owned by none other than Michael Haim. The shoe print in the car is interesting, but beyond that, uh, if it's his footprint, I'm not sure it means anything. My footprint is in my wife's car. That uh, doesn't mean I have ever done her any harm. Did you ever see your mommy sad? Mm-hmm. Was she OK, or was she hurt? In a bold attempt to uncover the truth, investigators arranged for child psychologists to interview Bonnie and Michael's son. Yes. How did she get hurt? They pushed her down and she her down. From what the child told us that day, my only conclusion was is that there had been a domestic fight and that Michael Haim had killed his wife and had removed her and that their three-and-a-half-year-old son had witnessed this. The credibility of a child is, is something that, that you have to, like I said, judge in perspective. He's said a couple of things that we know were not true. Mom's car is in the lake. We know her car wasn't there. The issue of child witness credibility is always a concern but generally, children do not lie about what they see, and they do not lie about what happens to them. At this point, custody of Bonnie and Michael's son is still in litigation. However, he is safe. Meanwhile, the families remain split about what, if anything, Michael Haim knows about his wife's disappearance. I'm not saying that I'm 100% convinced that Mike is innocent. I haven't seen any evidence that convinces me he's guilty. Uh, his behavior and general attitude convinces me that he's, he's not guilty. I think that Michael did something to Bonnie. I think her son was there, and I think he's seen exactly what happened. I think he witnessed his mother's murder. I refuse to give up hope that Bonnie is alive until we get some proof, some evidence that Bonnie's dead. Through his attorney, Michael Haim declined our request for an interview. He has not been formally charged with any crime. However, authorities still consider him to be the prime suspect in Bonnie's disappearance. In addition, investigators believe Michael may have had an accomplice, someone who picked him up after he left Bonnie's car at the airport and also helped to dispose of his wife's body. The possibility remains, of course, that Bonnie Haim is still alive. Next, if you like a good fright, you love The Devil's Backbone. 
Many believe it's the most haunted spot in America, and the eyewitness accounts leave little doubt. I was feeling extremely scared. It was a ghost. It had to be. I didn't tell anybody about it. That chilling sensation I got kind of stayed with me. There's something here. What it is, I don't know. I've had probably 25, 30 reportings of different spirits and ghosts from different people. They'll never leave. I'll be dead and gone. They'll be here. They call it the devil's backbone. And when it comes to ghosts per square mile, few places short of purgatory can match these 4,700 acres in central Texas. To get here, you head south, out of the state capital, Austin, about 50 miles, and some 200 years. The gnarled canyons of the devil's backbone are once home to Comanche and Apache Indians. And the 1700 Spaniards pushed through on the road to conquest. Among them was a Franciscan monk named Espinosa, infamous for his ruthless ambition. More than a century later, renegade Confederate soldiers on a doomed quest for gold breathed their last in the devil's backbone. Today their spirits live on, or so says longtime resident Bert Wall. I had a situation one time where I was finishing a, a, a particular thing I was writing, and it was late at night, about midnight, uh, and, and the dogs started barking a little bit, but not loud. The wind was blowing. It, it was a cold night. I looked through the window. Uh, that's when I saw a Spanish monk. I don't believe it could have been a person. There's no way. Uh, he was definitely from the 1700s. He was dressed that way in his habit or whatever, his cross hanging. I probably watched him for all 15 seconds, maybe, which is a long time. He disappeared in a way that was more of a gone. The luminous Spanish monk is but one of many spirits that prowl the ranch. Just ask John Myers. He came to Burt Wall's place to hunt deer, but hunting in the devil's backbone isn't like anywhere else in the world. The stand I was on uh, was a tree stand. Once I got up and situated myself, uh, you have to be real quiet and real still and uh, watch for the deer. As I was sitting up in the stand waiting, uh, and that's what you do a lot in deer hunting is just wait. I heard footprints or footsteps, I should say, walking around the tree, the base of the tree. I couldn't see because I was sitting on a platform and uh, it kept just walking in a circle, whatever it was. I, I started getting a little eerie feeling because it wouldn't move away from the tree. It just kept going in this circle. And finally, it, the, it just stopped. It didn't walk away. The sounds just stopped. And the sun started going down, and it started getting darker. And I thought, well, I'm just going to get on off the tree and walk back to the house. Uh, didn't see any footprints, twigs broken or branches broken or anything like that. Um, I kept getting this feeling that someone was watching me. So I stopped and I turned back and looked toward the tree and uh, there was an Indian. It was a very cold night. It was in the 20s and he was without a shirt. And he was looking at me rather strangely like, who are you? So immediately I turned around and started back toward the house. I noticed to my right, out of the corner of my eye that they were, he was there and he was walking parallel with me. 
I didn't feel threatened by him. It's just, you know, like, who are you and what are you doing here? And um, I made about two steps toward him, and when I did, he vanished. It was a ghost. It had to be, you know, to be able to do that. The bunkhouse was a site of yet another extraordinary vision, if you believe Lynn Gentry, one-time foreman at Burt Falls Ranch. I was kind of relaxing, and off in the distance, I heard what at first I thought was thunder. Then as the sound came closer, I realized that it was horses' hooves in a very fast run. There were uh, several horses with probably 15 or 20 riders on them, what I believe to have been Confederate soldiers. They certainly looked real to me at the time. But then when you begin to slowly realize that, hey, what I'm looking at is not real. You know, it, this is, these are ghosts. Perhaps most amazing of all was the experience of John Villarreal. A few years back, John was hiking with two friends in an area known as the Haunted Valley. John claims he not only saw a supernatural vision of a wolf, but that the spirit actually possessed him. Corey and BC were off in another part of the creek, and uh, I got this sensation and uh, basically saw a vision of a wolf. I was looking up, watching it come towards me, and uh, it leapt at me. And uh, where it would have hit me, I felt the just a chilling sensation go through me. We, we didn't see anything mysterious. Uh, it's all what John says that he saw. When we got back into the truck, it got extremely cold in the truck. He was sitting in between BC and I. I was sitting on the passenger side, so the whole left-hand side of my body got extremely numb and cold. It's almost like if there was a big block of ice sitting next to me. When we got back to the ranch that night, I, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if my friend was going to be all right. Um, I was actually pretty worried about him. According to his friends, John initially lapsed into a silent trance. When he did speak, his voice was an unearthly baritone. John suddenly seemed obsessed with Indian massacres, ambushes, and other little-known events from the history of Devil's Backbone. While I was standing there, I was feeling extremely scared. And all of a sudden, a big gust of wind came out of the kitchen. I, I was just in shock. I didn't know what that was. Um, I stood there kind of frozen and kept asking questions. What, what, what was that? What was that? And then that's when someone said, I think the spirit's left him. I think it's gone now. I don't know for sure what kind of spirit was inside of me, uh, but something that knew about this ranch, that knew about the history of the ranch, had to be going through me. And uh, it's, it's hard to believe, but it, you know, basically that's what would have had to happen. Here in the Devil's Backbone, ghosts are as common as spines on a cactus. But why should this particular patch of land prove so irresistible to spirits? The devil's backbone is haunted because it's loved. It's loved by the spirits. It's loved by myself. And I imagine someday when I'm gone, I will haunt this same son of a gun. If the local accounts are anything close to true, Bert Wall would join a host of other souls who once called this place home. Bold company in which to spend the rest of eternity.
Join me next time for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries.